Happy Sabbath. Welcome to our BUC online service. We welcome each and every one of you as we worship this morning. I trust and hope that you've had a good week. And if you've had a challenging week, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us have this day where we can set aside our cares and worries, our anxieties and our fears, and just lay them at the foot of the cross and let the voice of God speak to our hearts today. This quarter is a new uh, quarter. We'll be focusing on Christian education. And uh, we're going to look at the importance of education in the home as we go into a new series. And we're going to join Pastor Derek Morris with Hope Sabbath School as we now delve into this interesting area of conversation. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth interactive study of the Word of God. I'm excited today. We're beginning a brand new series. We could call it education, uh, going to the Bible and learning lessons for life. That's what I've called the series, Lessons for Life. Today, learning from Eden. But I want to tell you, we're not just wanting to glean the wisdom of the world, but wisdom from the Bible about how to live, especially in these troubled times. You'll notice if you take a look at our panel that we're working with a reduced team because we're filming in the middle of a health pandemic. But we believe that God is going to work in a powerful way in spite of the challenges. Amen. 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 And we're really glad that you're with us uh, during this season as we talk about lessons for life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that there is counsel in your word, lessons for life. Today, as we begin our series with learning from Eden, I pray that you would bless us. We want to learn lessons that will help us in these troubled times in which we live. And I pray for our Hope Sabbath School family around the world and for our team as we're gathered here for this in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. Guide us by your Spirit, energize our minds, and we open our hearts to you just now. Mm. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 We're going to the book of Genesis. We're studying about learning in Eden. Now, for those who may not be familiar with the name Eden, that was the name of the garden that God gave as a gift to our first parents, the Garden of Eden. Now, someone might be saying, Derek, you don't really believe that that's literal, do you? I mean, that there was a first parents, Adam and Eve is the name according to Scripture. And they lived in a garden called Eden. And my response would be, they say, well, how do you know? You weren't there. And I would agree. I wasn't there. But you know, Jesus, Matthew 19, speaks about God creating male and female. Jesus trusted that the Bible record was true, right? Yes. And I'm a follower of Jesus. So yes. I'm trusting Jesus talks about Abel. He talks about Noah, yeah. talks about Moses and David. He believed that the scriptures were given by inspiration mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. yes. Every word he said that proceeds yeah. from the mouth of God. We can trust in that, right? Yeah. Yes. So we're going back to an inspired record, not just mm -hmm. a, a myth. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn from the Garden of Eden, Billy. I'd like you to start our study, if sure. you would, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Okay. Genesis means beginnings, right? It's the mm -hmm. book of beginnings. And how does your Bible read there in Genesis 2, 7 and 8? Sure. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. Genesis 2, verses 7 and 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So if we didn't have any other information, Harold, there's some important things in this text, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's just a fragment that we found. We said, oh, we found a fragment from the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. What important information could we glean just from that text? 
Well, God is our creator. Right. We were created. <laughs> That's yes. big, right? I mean, <laughs> we're not here by accident. Yes. God mm -hmm. created us. And what else could we learn from the text, Jason? We can learn that He formed us physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Sabina? And also, we were planted in a garden. We were planted yeah. in a garden. Now, <laughs> we don't know, like, what were we supposed to do in the garden, <laughs> uh, our first parents? Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly, we'll discover that God created our first parents mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. so they could love Him. In fact, this whole series is about a God who loves us with an immeasurable and unfailing love. That's why he wants to teach us lessons for life, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're in this garden. We're going to learn a little more about the garden after your comments, Sabina. And we also the other thing that we can, we can learn from this text is that God made us from the dust of the ground. So I think that's also an important information that we can realize that we were made out of the dust of the ground. And that's God a, breathed yes. uh, his yes. breath yes. into us. An yeah. interesting scripture later will say when we die, our body returns to the dust and yeah. our breath returns to God who mm -hmm. gave it, right? Yeah. So that's kind of the reversal of that creation. Brittany. Mm -hmm. I think another important note to realize in this verse is that God is a very intimate God and that he wants relationship with us. I mean, the very first being that Adam saw when he, you know, became alive was his creator. Breathing in his nostrils. <laughs> and bringing exactly. him to life. Yes. And, yeah. and so it shows us how intimate God is. He's not some distant God far away that just spoke and left us to be as we are, but he wants to have that daily mm -hmm. walk with us. And it's just beautiful yes. to see that. You know, mm -hmm. and while you're saying that, and I'll come to your point, Harold, uh, I'm just thinking of that famous text of Jesus, God so loved mm -hmm. the world. And you're saying we see it even in the garden. Yes. Yes. He could have said, let there be man. But instead, he, yes. he shapes and forms and yeah. breathes life yeah. into him. Harold? Mm -hmm. Actually, I was just going to echo that because if you see the creation before man, everything he spoke and it was done. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But here he had to actually stoop down and touch the clay. Who knows? Like right. full yeah. form and spend time right. in creating that and, being. And you see, he had to do that. But in a sense, he didn't. He could have just spoken, right? True. Why does he have to do it? Because... He loves us. Intimacy. He exactly. wants to communicate yeah. Yeah. Relationship. this intimacy, right? Yeah. This relationship mm -hmm. with us. But well, let's get back to the garden. Uh, we're having a great discussion. This is good. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to know that there's a God who mm -hmm. not only created us, but loves us, right? Yes. 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 That's really good Amen. news. Sabina, could you read verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2? Sure. I'll be reading from the New International Version, uh, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, this is before sin. This is before the curse with thistles and thorns. Mm -hmm. Has anyone here ever done any gardening? Any gardening people? Yeah. Brittany, uh, how would you describe the task of gar gardening in today's world? Well, it can be really hard work. My brother and I had a landscaping business and we used to pull weeds and, you know, put down fertilizer and the wood chips and plant flowers and all of that. And it took a lot of time, a lot of sweat, a lot of effort. And as soon as you have it looking beautiful, you've got to go weed it again. So. <laughs> I remember my wife and I planted tomato plants this year and, and I was looking just a couple of days ago and I found the dreaded hornworm. <laughs> you know, it's like this big green worm with little horns, oh, and wow. it can just eat all of the leaves in a matter of a couple of days. Wow. You know, yeah. and I was like, no, not the horn worm, you know. Uh, yeah. But back then, it was perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't mm -hmm. God say it was very good? good? Very yeah. good, yeah. okay. Very good. So what would there be to do, Sabina, you, to tend yeah. and work the garden if there's no thorns, no weeds, no thistles, no invasive mm -hmm. species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that probably like just cultivating and observing them growing and becoming beautiful and different as time passes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that walking in the garden and looking at them was already in itself a joy. And the cultivation, I would say probably something like uh, picking the fruits or things that you're going to eat to prepare something. There is also a process, right? So mm -hmm. those are some things I can think of that they were doing there. What, would, what lessons might, might uh, our first mm -hmm. parents have learned even in that cultivation of that perfect environment? Mm -hmm. Billy? I think mm -hmm. uh, the fact that work is a blessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something we should value. So we should, we should never look down upon you know, somebody, whatever the work may be, well, not all work, but you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I think we value different type of work. Um, somebody who's uh, maybe a, a janitor, you know, we don't give that mm -hmm. much respect as somebody who might be like a president of a country or something. Mm -hmm. So God value work and work, I think brings something inside of us 
that God wants to teach us. It, it might be the fact that, you know, we should be always active in, in producing and taking care of other mm -hmm. things. So. Isn't there something in the commandment which says six days labor? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the seventh day is the Sabbath, right? right. That's a special yeah. day of rest. That also goes back to creation. Mm -hmm. But in the same commandment, it says, mm -hmm. don't rest all seven, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. right? Six days work. Right. So there were lessons mm -hmm. that, that uh, Adam was learning mm -hmm. uh, during this time. I need to move on to verses okay. 19 and 20. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jason if you'd read that for us, 19 and 20. Um, actually, for the, the first half of verse 20, 19 through 20a, what else was happening, learning in the garden? Sure, I'll be reading here from the New King James Version. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, and the first part of verse 20. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. Mm -hmm. um, how do you decide what to name something? <laughs> it's a hard choice. Yeah, has anyone had a pet of any mm -hmm. kind? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yes, pet, what kind of pet have you had, Harold? Um, I don't know, it came with the house that we bought in the Dominican <laughs> Republic. The pet came with the house? And they already had names. Oh, they were <laughs> names. Did anybody have to name a pet? Yeah. Uh, Jason, what pet did you have? So I've had cats before. Okay. And uh, it sounds plural, right? Yes. One at a time or like whole herds of cats? Uh, like two at a time. Two at a of. time, okay. How did you decide uh, to name them? So one cat I named Mittens because it had a little dark spots on its paws. And so I was like, oh, these are kind of like Mittens. Mm. So I thought about what I knew in my life and how the cat related to things that I was already familiar with. And I gave names that way. Okay, mm. so that's kind of a personal thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Brittany? I had a puppy and I had wanted a puppy since I was two and a half and I didn't get one until I was 17. Oh my. Um, but I prayed for that puppy and I got to choose it and once I got her I found out that um, she was born on Christmas Eve and I named her Noel. Um, and so that had a special meaning because of when she was born. So sometimes it can be when something is born or something that they remind you of. It's interesting, uh, I'm sure folks watching on the program, maybe you can't see everyone's face, but when Jason was talking about mittens mm -hmm. and when Brittany was talking about Noel, they were smiling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a relational thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So Adam is given this opportunity mm -hmm. to name all of these animals, Billy. And also I think not just, well, in, in our world, I, I even you know, I have friends who name their cars, who name their laptops, mm -hmm. their computers, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering why, but be basically they feel that sort of relationship and they because they value that thing they give it a name it a so name. it's not just yeah. another blue car it's you know Jonathan I mean I'm just making this stuff <laughs> up but you know they want to make it personal and that's the relationship that's yeah. uh, that they found in in that thing you know, so. Mm -hmm. so Adam's got work to do in the garden he's learning yeah. he's learning about the relationship that God wants with him mm -hmm. yeah he's learning about his environment yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful environment. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's us growing. Yeah. I mean, he's never seen things grow before, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, whoa. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's learning uh, about the diversity of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Brittany? Yes. I also think about the responsibility because earlier on in Genesis chapter 2, it said that God, or in Genesis chapter 1, that God gave um, Adam and Eve the garden to take care of it and to mm -hmm. subdue it and to, you know, they were responsible for it. So they're learning responsibility. And I remember as a child when I was learning responsibility with my pets and with different jobs my parents gave me, it gave me a sense of uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. It gave me mm -hmm. joy to know that I had something under my care that I needed to take good care of. Yeah. And so I think maybe they were learning about God and how He cares for us as they were caring mm -hmm. for something that He gave to them, a gift. Now, yeah. uh, you used the word they, but at least at this point it's just He, mm -hmm. because we're getting to chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 20b, mm -hmm. the second half. Jason, you read through the first half. Could you read just the second half of Genesis 20, uh, 2 and verse 20? Sure. I'm reading here New King James Version, Genesis 2, verse 20, and the second half says this, But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable or comparable 
to him. <laughs> mm. What did he notice, Harold, as he looked at all of the animals? Yeah, they had a couple. I mean, there were a couple. There was a male and female yeah. for the animals, but he didn't have a companion. He's like... <laughs> Comparable to him, of course. What's wrong with this picture, right? Yeah. yeah. What's he thinking? We don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Take a guess, Sabine. Sabina, what's he thinking? I think he's wondering if he would ever have someone like him that ah. he could share. Probably he was observing the animals and how they would play together and how would they, they have fun and even have their own way of communicating. And probably he felt a little lonely. Mm. That's one of the things. Maybe also he wondered if there could be someone to help him cultivate the garden and give names to the animals. He saw that it was work and it's more joyful when you have someone else doing work with you, at least for me. Mm -hmm. So probably he felt that difference also of being lonely compared to the animals. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Maybe he was looking. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. I mean, he found a lot of animals, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wondering if he would find a helper comparable to him, Jason. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing he probably noticed his uniqueness. There are, there are uh, benefits and also, you know, uh, downsides when one is mm -hmm. by themselves. So in this case, he can see, well, you know, I'm unique, I'm different. There's something God is doing uh, different here. He probably didn't understand all what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely agree with uh, Sabine that he, he, he realized that he lacked something. It may have been nice to be the only one, but after a while, uh, being single can get old, and then you want someone to be there to help you with all this process of taking care of the garden. Yeah. So let's keep reading the story, Billy, verses 21 to 23 of Genesis 2. And I really am thankful for the scriptures because we wouldn't know the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as I said, Jesus, our Savior, we're followers of Jesus, mm -hmm. he believed that this was yeah. historical record, right? Inspired right. by God so that we could know what happened back there. Mm -hmm. Let, let's see how the story unfolds. Sure. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed, it, closed up the flesh inst uh, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman mm -hmm. and brought her unto the men. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall, shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So that's kind of strange. Mm. You told me, Harold, that in the beginning, with much, he just said, let there be, and it happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With Adam, he gets down and out of the mm. dust of the yeah. ground yeah. and breathes into him. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's this about taking a spare part Mm -hmm. out of Adam. I mean, he didn't need to do that, did mm -hmm. he? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Correct. Uh, someone might even say that's stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, I guess if you're making it up, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't put that in, right? Mm -hmm. You'd say, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But the, the prophet Moses, who writes Genesis, mm -hmm. is, is telling us what happened. Mm -hmm. Brittany, what, what's going on here? I think there's several things. One, if we think about what God chose, he chose a side, a part of a side of Adam. So he could have chosen, you know, part of his ear to make Eve, or he could have chosen one of his toes or something like that and made her. And then she could have been above Adam if she was made from something higher up or something lower down. But he took something from her side to show that she's comparable to him. She's equal to him. She has equal value and she's a part of you. When something's a part of you, like when people have children, they want to nurture and take care of that. And they have this special like relationship. This, this child has part of my genes, right? And maybe there's something there with this closeness. Mm -hmm. This wife, he says, she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She's part of me. I'm going to take care of her. We're going to partner together in this relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we don't want to allegorize the story, you know, excessively, but, but that's pretty close to your heart. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know where you take the, yeah. the rib from, but yeah. it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But there's a lesson there, isn't mm -hmm. there? We're talking about yeah. lessons for life, yes. right? Yeah. It's not just he added another acquisition. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is bone of my bone yeah. and flesh of my flesh. Anybody yes. else want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm, I was thinking also that the very fact that God made Eve out of his ribs and from the side, and as you were saying, close to the heart, it may refer to the fact that he wanted them to have a relationship. Just as God had created 
Adam to have a relationship of love with God and with the animals and with creation, that also this person, that was not just someone else that would be there, you know, um, with no relationship with Adam, but also someone that would be so close, more close even than the other animals. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that I can think of. And the fact that it, it was created out of Adam to make sure that there was no difference between them, that God loved and had them both as precious to him mm -hmm. and that very special creation that was the only one who was created out of the dust and with the breath of God was equal. So s same person, same thing. Uh, that's something also. That's beautiful. That that's beautiful. And I think yeah. back to Genesis 1 that Brittany referred to, mm -hmm. it speaks there of Adam as male and female. You mm -hmm. know, it's like yeah. the human family, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In the image of God. Yes. Mm -hmm. that it yeah. takes both of them yeah. as a a reflection of the image of God. Yeah, there would be no question whether she was also in the likeness of God. You right. Know? So. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. We want to move on to an important topic. Uh, in this garden, first Adam and now Adam and mm -hmm. his companion, which he's very happy about, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a helpmeet, right? Mm -hmm. Best friend. Mm -hmm. um, is there good in the garden? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. It's very good, I mean, right? Yeah. Very good, yes. Is there evil in the garden. Yes. <clears throat> There's evil in a tree in the garden. Ah, let's take a look. <clears throat> uh, apparently there's something bigger happening on a cosmic level, right? Let's take a look at that, Brittany. If you could read for us in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17? Yes. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Mm. Why did God put this, uh, this tree in the midst of the garden? Uh, it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was the fruit toxic? Um, what, what's going on here? What, what don't we know from the narrative at this point that's going on cosmically? Jason? So before this time, apparently, and we get this from other places in Scripture, there has been a battle, a war, if you will, in heaven between, you could say, the forces of evil, which were led by Satan, and God. And apparently there was a rebellion. Uh, the forces of evil lost. They got kicked out of heaven. And so now uh, God, because he allows freedom, because he allows free will, he allowed the force of evil led by the devil to be present on this earth at this creation so that the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, could actually choose for themselves whether they would choose God or whether they would choose uh, Satan, the forces of evil. This is basically an opportunity for free will that's taking place here. Mm -hmm. I don't think, some people might say, that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Just ban uh, the angel once called Lucifer, now mm -hmm. called the devil and Satan. You were referencing mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 12, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Verses 7 through, through 12. So, uh, by the way, just in case you were thinking you made that up, this great great series on Bible prophecy, which includes Revelation, hopebiblestudy.org. You ought to be studying the Bible prophecies right now because they're being mm -hmm. fulfilled. And you were quoting from the prophecy there in Revelation. Mm -hmm. But some people might say, I think that's a bad idea, Sabina. Just yeah. ban mm -hmm. this fallen angel and all of the angels. Doesn't it say a third of the angels? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, joined mm -hmm. in the rebellion. It's hard for us to fathom that. Mm -hmm. But Satan uses lies and deception, mm -hmm. which yeah. we'll now see in the garden. Yeah. Why doesn't God just ban him and say, you can't go near this planet and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and tempt my creation? Yeah, I think that we need to be very cautious when you approach this issue of the mystery of iniquity, right? God knows everything and He loves us so much in a very special way. And I think that the Bible points to the fact that He did His very best to the point of even going to the cross so that evil could be finally exterminated. But at this point in, hum in humanity, in the history of humanity, we know that God has chosen love. And love depended on freedom. Mm -hmm. And simply removing it and exterminating Satan and the angels that were falling would be approved maybe or would 
made people have questions and raised the questions whether this was not a tyrannic god who was just trying to shut the mouth of those who were opposing him or who were wondering if he was truly go good and holy. So I believe that part of it has to do with the fact that he still had to show us to have a display of his love through the allowance of us to have choices even to choose evil, unfortunately. Mm. That's a very costly plan, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah. God so loved the world that he yeah. gave. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a costly plan, but it's a plan from a good, loving God yeah. mm -hmm. exactly. who wants yeah. us to be free. Mm -hmm. Well, there's this plan. Don't, don't go to the tree. Don't eat yeah. the fruit of it. There's a warning given. Yeah. We want to pick up in Genesis chapter 3, Harold, if you could read. Yes. Mm -hmm. You maybe read that many times, but someone watching Hope Sabbath School today has never heard these words. They say, if it was good, how did we get into the mess that we're in today? This mm -hmm. is another lesson for life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we listen to the lies of the enemy, mm -hmm. pain and death will come. Mm -hmm. Let's see what it says in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 8. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree of but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Mm -hmm. Then the serpent said to the woman, you, shall, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Mm -hmm. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. What's the immediate evidence that what Satan said was a lie? Fear. Yeah. Fear. Fear, that's right. <laughs> Instead of saying you'll be like God, which by the way, if you read the prophecy in Isaiah, is mm. what Satan wanted. Mm -hmm. I will be like the Most High, right? Yeah. Isn't that in chapter 14? Mm -hmm. I will be like yeah. the Most High. Mm -hmm. He wanted to usurp the place of God. Mm -hmm. Now he's yeah. telling our first parents, you know, you can be like God. But you're right, Brittany. The immediate response, having listened to the lie, mm -hmm. is fear. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was the Im immediate response of the angels that joined the rebellion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after they were cast out. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the opposite of love. Ah, yeah. perfect love casts out fear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you separate mm -hmm. from a God of love, mm -hmm. yeah. fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you've read the story, and I would encourage those of you studying to go and read Genesis chapter 3. But let's, let's just help me. What were some of the immediate responses after fear mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. came uh, as a result of listening to Satan's lies mm -hmm. and, and disobeying God? Harold? They, it says that they realized they were naked. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow, what is this new experience that they are like? There's a loss of some kind, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, Brittany? Yeah, along with that shame, they're, yeah. they're trying to cover themselves. So they're feeling ashamed. Loss, shame, fear. Jason? Mm -hmm. They're trying to hide from God. They want physical separation. Mm -hmm. yeah. From the one who loves them with yeah. immeasurable and mm -hmm. unfailing love. Something wrong, right? Yes. Yeah. What else? And even the environment. The environment became like, it became cool. So they s started sensing some sort of, you know, difference in the environment mm -hmm. because of that. So not just them, but also the environment uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, was, was damaged, I guess, by their um, sin. Mm. And, yeah. and we can't forget that they knew the warning that God already said. So they thought like, well, this is it for us. I mean, God did say, and we disobeyed. So I don't know what will happen to us. So maybe <laughs> that they will die. Yeah. yeah. Um, look in Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 
and 24. And let's see what the outcome is, Brittany. Uh, lots of things happening, including the environment is now cursed also, right? Weeds and thistles and so on. Genesis chapter 2 or Genesis chapter 3? Genesis uh, three. chapter 3. Thank you. Verses 23 and 24. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Why didn't God just say, that was a very bad thing that you did, but you can stay in this beautiful garden? Well, well, yes, Harold. Sorry, mm -hmm. but if you think about it, there was a tree of life, and if they had access to the tree of life, that would extend their life. That, 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 I mean, it, that's what it seems. So, the fact that there was a tree of life, then that means sin would have been perpetuated on this earth, and we would have been living for eternity, but in sin, mm -hmm. if that was the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jason, God has put natural laws and natural consequences in place, and so He, by His own uh, authority that he has done, he has to follow through with what he has planned. So if he mm -hmm. says something, then it's required that it happens. So God, God himself uh, has, has restricted uh, this process there. And so he had to kick them out of the garden even again, because yes, otherwise they could have lived forever because of what God has set up here. Mm -hmm. So is there any hope? Mm. Um, they're, they're being banished from this garden. I, I can only imagine that they're weeping uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe the angels wept uncontrollably after they were cast out. Mm -hmm. They realized mm -hmm. that the lies of the enemy did mm -hmm. not bring good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there any hope stirring in their hearts, Brittany? This is a lesson. Maybe someone's watching Hope Sabbath School and saying, I've never lived in Eden but I've wept over things that where Satan has tricked me and deceived mm -hmm. me, and I felt like there was no hope. Mm -hmm. Was there any hope there in the hearts of our first parents? There were several things that God did before he caused them to leave the, the garden, but one is in Genesis 3.15 where he gave them a promise, and he said that, you know, there's going to be a seed, and that seed will crush the head of the serpent, mm -hmm. but it will be bruised in the process. And so that gave them hope. Well, maybe a descendant of ours will be our savior. Maybe, maybe there's hope. Maybe we aren't going to have this eternal separation from God. And this one who deceived us, he's going to be crushed. Was so, it true that a descendant of theirs would be their savior? Yes. 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 It yeah. took longer than they thought, right? Yes. I think they were hoping uh, Genesis 4 when their firstborn came, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. that maybe he was yeah. the one, yes. yeah. but they had been given a promise. What other little glimmer of promise was there besides Genesis 3.15 about the seed, a, a descendant would come and crush the serpent? Yes, well, Willie. not necessarily the promise, but the fact that God did not kill them. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Remember, remember that God created them, so he could have created another set of couples easily, mm -hmm. mm. but he chose not to do that, so that gave them some hope that, you know what, God is working something out, mm. yeah. um, even from that surface uh, text, and we're going to dig more to find the, out. There's one other important insight in verse 21. Mm. Uh, Jason, would you read that for us in Genesis 3, 21? Sure, I'm reading here from the New King James Version. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where did he get that skin? Well, you could have, he could have just said, let there be skins, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but, but as we read through the scriptures all the way up to Messiah, who's called the mm -hmm. Lamb of God, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. or even back in Abraham, God will provide mm -hmm. a lamb. A lamb? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what happened in the garden, Sabina? He probably had to kill an animal so that he could clothe Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. um, even though it may sound, uh, you know, a gleam of hope, at the same time it probably brought them sadness as well. Because if they were there naming the animals, they were precious to them as well probably. And they felt in their own life the pain for losing an animal that they had named probably. So, so this, uh, this symbol of of a, a lamb dying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being clothed yeah. instead of naked mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a little hope. Maybe they can smell it every once in a while and say, yeah. 
we, we don't have to despair. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. You know, I don't know about you, but I have, I have wondered, without hope, mm -hmm. uh, that Adam and Eve might have just killed themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If not then, well, let's look at the next part of the story mm -hmm. in Genesis chapter 4, because there were some lessons they learned after Eden as well. Mm -hmm. Sabine, if you could read the first two verses of Genesis chapter 4. Okay. So Gen Genesis chapter 4, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So what do we learn so far? What lessons could Eve and her husband learn from uh, this next part of the story? Mm. Yes? Well, when you have children, you learn to love them and take care of them. I haven't had children myself, but I've worked with a lot of children. And as you work with children, you learn, wow, look how creative they are. And, oh, look, they need my help. They just fell and hurt themselves. And, you know, different things where you realize, wow, if I have this kind of love for this child, uh, how much more does God love me? Mm -hmm. and, and look at the mercy. I want to give my child patience and mercy and grace. How much more does God want to give that to me? So as they're caring for their children, they're learning more and more about God's character and how he treats them. Mm -hmm. And she did recognize this uh, child as a gift from the Lord, exactly. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what else did, did, could they learn by looking at these two children? They had to name them too, right? Mm -hmm. Cain, yeah. Abel. Yes, Sabina. I probably believe that they have learned also about love and the love that God had towards them now that they have also someone coming out of their own likeness. So I think that's something that they learn how, how much God loved them. Mm -hmm. And even in this difficult scenario, after leaving the garden, they still could recognize Eve says, right? That I, I have brought forth a man with the help of the Lord. Uh -huh. So she could still realize God in her life. Mm -hmm. Harold? Yeah. And also it says that the two sons that she had, they had different skills. Mm -hmm. So who knows what kind of personality, what kind of thing they liked. So they had to even learn how to work with that. Mm -hmm. With, with, their, with their children. Uh, I, I wish it would say, and they all lived happily yeah. ever after. Yeah. But there's another lesson that they're going to learn in mm -hmm. the garden, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jason, could you read verses 3 through 8 of Genesis chapter 4? I'm reading here from the New King James Version, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Mm. Mm -hmm. First uh, murder, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Two brothers, mm -hmm. one kills the other one. Mm -hmm. um, why was he so angry? It says he was angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? Why was he so angry? Mm -hmm. I think, I think jealousy. You know, he was mm -hmm. jealous that uh, uh, Abel, you know, found favor in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. So the jealousy drove in some, you know, hatred towards him. Mm. Why did Abel find favor? This is a lesson for us, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brittany, mm -hmm. and, and or was it that he found favor or that his offering was acceptable and Cain's was not? Brittany? Mm -hmm. We don't have, you know, direct instruction from God before this, but we do have the example of um, God killing an animal and clothing them and then later on we have the sacrificial system being set up So we learn later on in scripture that without the mm -hmm. shedding of blood. There's no remission of sin 
and the, the scripture says that specifically. And so to bring vegetables, nothing has to give its blood. And this was to be pointing forward to their savior. And so when Cain is bringing vegetables, it's not what God asked. God is saying, look, it's not vegetables that are going to die for you. It's, it's my own son who's going to shed his blood. Mm -hmm. And so that is why Abel's sacrifice was acceptable. God must have instructed them, while we don't have it recorded here, that this was what they needed to do for forgiveness of sin, that there's a Messiah coming who will give his own life. And Cain wasn't willing to accept that sacrifice, that substitute for himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sabina? Yeah. And another thing that I can think of, it says here on verse 3, uh, that in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering, but Abel brought fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't have the clear instructions of what happened before if God gave them particulars about it. But we know that one, that he was wrong because God said further down that if he had done the right, he would, you know, be fine. So we know that he didn't do the right thing. And the second thing we know is that it was not the best of what he had that he brought as an offering. It appears like he got some things that was not, uh, you know, the very firstborn or the fat portion like Abel did. Mm. So I also... So I'll give you something, thing. but it may not be the best, exactly, but even yeah. worse, it's not what you asked for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Let's talk about the character of God, because this whole series mm -hmm. on Lessons for Life is learning mm -hmm. about the character of God. Um, someone said with the first parents, he could have just destroyed them and made two more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What can we learn about the character of God from the way he treated Cain, mm -hmm. after Cain not only disregarded his counsel, mm -hmm. but killed his, young, his younger mm -hmm. brother. What can we learn? Let's take a look in Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 through 15. Brittany, if you could read that for us. Again, I, I would want us to not only realize this is a really sad story, mm -hmm. and, and Cain has listened to Satan's lies, mm -hmm. but catch a glimpse of the character of God in the midst of the story. Mm -hmm. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version, Genesis chapter 4, verses 9 through 15. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. What do you think? What can we learn about the character of God from the story, Billy? God has a lot of mercy. <laughs> yes. he, yeah. he has a By lot the way, I, I just grew up automatic, automatically concluding that Satan, that Cain never repented. Mm. I don't know that. Mm. Mm. Right? Yeah. Do I know that from the text? No. no. I don't know that. Mm -mm. All I know is that God is merciful. very yeah. merciful. Oh, yes. And... Uh, doesn't it say in the scripture, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. yep. he's mm -hmm. faithful and just to forgive us. Forgive now us. we may get a thousand emails saying he didn't repent. Well, he had an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's the mercy of God. Brittany. Yeah, it reminds me of a verse in, I believe it's Second Peter, that says that God is not willing that any should perish, mm -hmm. but that all mm -hmm. should come to repentance. So it, God is showing us that here. Look, I don't want you to perish. I want you to have an opportunity to repent, and I'm going to give you a long life. Anyone who tries to come against you, I'm going to bring vengeance seven times on that mm -hmm. person. I'm preserving you. Mm -hmm. Second Peter 3, verse 9, mm -hmm. that God is not willing that any, including Cain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mercy of God. We don't know the rest of the story, yeah. but we know that God gave him time and opportunity and even protection, yeah. yes. right? Yeah. 
Sabina? I also think that this shows a lot of grace. That with mercy comes grace because he didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. right? there was yeah. n there, he did nothing to deserve it. Actually, if God was going to pay back with what he deserved, he would be fulminated at the very moment he killed his brother. But yet God allowed him because of mercy and grace. And the other thing that I find about the text, and that's looking back towards verse 6, when God asks him, why are you angry? The way that he approaches, um, I, I feel like he was being so kind. Mm. I think he was just so kind. Imagine if you just witness someone killing the other. Like, what happened? Like, why, why did you do that? Wondering if there was something happening maybe in his heart, in his mind, and giving him the chance to express himself. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence in the text at this point that Cain asks for forgiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Or repents or says, I'm sorry, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, if we ended there, we've just got a few minutes left. I want to talk about the mm -hmm. fact that there is promise in Scripture, and I'm just going to let you share from your study of the Scripture that Eden will one day be restored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means no more sin, no more lies, no more death, mm -hmm. right? No more pain, mm -hmm. a restoration mm -hmm. of the perfect environment. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see promises of that in the scripture? Well, Brittany said there's that promise right at the beginning about the seed mm -hmm. that will mm -hmm. come, that will crush the serpent. What about the creation of a new heavens and yes. a new earth? Yeah. Yeah. Even in Revelation, uh, yeah. I believe tw chapter 21 or 22, where actually we will be have access to the tree of life once again, mm -hmm. something that we were barred from. Well, maybe we should go there. Let's go mm -hmm. to Revelation, uh, to two passages. Revelation 20. 21, 1 to 5, if you could read that. And then Jason, if you could read Genesis, uh, Revelation 22, 1 to 5. So 21, 1 to 5, and 22, 1 to 5. And by the way, back to studying the prophecies of the Bible, hopebiblestudy.org, there's a series on Bible prophecy. We are in the midst of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and we're going to see Edom restored soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited. Amen. That's good news, <laughs> yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So let's look at Revelation 21, 1 to 5, mm -hmm. and then 22, 1 to 5. All right. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat at the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And Jason, we've just got time for, Genesis, for Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Two verses. Uh, what does the Bible say in the last chapter? New King James Version, Genesis chapter, Revelation, sorry, 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. We need that, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. <laughs> Promise of Eden restored. Yeah. Le learning from Eden, mm -hmm. a loving God, merciful God, mm -hmm. redemptive God, mm -hmm. going to make all things new. Yes. Mm -hmm. My friend, yes. uh, I hope you'll join us on this series, uh, Lessons for Life. We're going to go through the scriptures and learn lessons. But what would be the most important lesson today? That God loves us with an immeasurable and unfailing love. Mm -hmm. Maybe you walked away with tears like our first parents. Maybe you walked away with tears like Cain. Mm -hmm. But there is forgiveness, mm -hmm. there's a new beginning, and there's hope of Eden restored through faith in our Savior Jesus. Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our assurance, mm -hmm. and that's the good news that we can share with those around us. Mm -hmm. Let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, thank you for the scriptures that contain powerful lessons for life. And I pray in the name of Jesus that we would catch a clearer glimpse of the immeasurable and unfailing love of God, the mercy of God, the patience of God, that we would accept the grace extended and the assurance of Eden restored and a blessed hope for the future. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Jesus would have died for just one person of the 1.3 billion who live in India, Bhutan, Nepal, and the Maldives. That's how much he loves the people here in the Southern Asia Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The work of the Adventist Church began in Southern Asia and in India in 1893. Five coal porters, two from America and a family of three from New Zealand, arrived to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next year brought another missionary, Georgia Burris. The mission board of the Seventh-day Adventist Church paid Georgia's passage from the United States to India. Once there, she was responsible for her own living expenses, but God provided in miraculous ways. Later, she married a fellow missionary, and together they ministered in India for 40 years. From these humble beginnings, the Adventist Church in Southern Asia has grown to 1.6 million members. We praise God for this growth. But the vast majority of people in this region have not yet heard the good news about Jesus. Less than 1% of the population are Adventist. The Maldives, a country of 392,000 people, has no Adventist work. More than 800 languages are spoken in Nepal, Bhutan, and India. We have materials in only a handful of those languages. And yet church members, such as Global Mission Pioneers, are sharing the love of Jesus in communities throughout this vast territory. Urban centers of influence have been established in cities, and thousands are being helped through schools and medical institutions. Sheer Memorial Hospital has been treating the sick in Nepal since 1960, and there are 11 more Adventist hospitals that offer holistic medical care in India. Thousands receive a holistic education at 144 Adventist secondary schools and nine institutions of higher education across India, including Spicer Adventist University. Hope Channel India broadcasts in nine languages, sharing stories of encouragement and inspiration to people such as Rajesh. Overwhelmed with financial difficulties in his family, Rajesh just couldn't concentrate at work. He lost his job and became depressed. One day he came across Hope Channel India's prayer line and asked for prayer. This was the first step in getting to know Jesus and finding hope for his family. He now has a new job to provide for his family. Please continue to pray for the people of India, Bhutan, Nepal, and the Maldives. And pray for the church. With limited resources and in the face of many challenges, it seeks to remain faithful to God's call. Thank you for your mission offerings which fuel mission in the Southern Asia Division and around the world. Welcome back once again as we go into our family service. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Kirk Thomas. He's our Evangelism Director at the British Union Conference and we're happy to have him and we, we wait for the message that God would have us to hear through him. As we worship together today, may we truly um, just allow God to speak to our hearts today. May he teach us his ways. May we learn something new may this worship experience be something that will really trigger something in our lives that will endeavor us or our motivation, our desire to have a closer walk with him. Let us think together now as we 
um, join together in singing hymns of praise.
This is the part of our service where we'd like to show you how you can give to your local conference or mission through your tithes, offerings or donations. I used to slap and punch other girls. One time during recess, my classmates and I were chatting around the table in our classroom at the E by 7th Day Avenue School in the Marshall Islands. I was hungry, but I didn't want to run across the street to the store to buy a snack. Go buy me a piece of cake and some soup, I told the girl beside me, handing her some money. The girl didn't want to go. I'm tired, she said. Ah, oh, you're so boring, I exclaimed. Then I laughed and punched the girl hard in the shoulder. The girl was smiling and laughing until I struck her, but then she grew quiet. I guess she didn't like being hit. But I couldn't stop myself. Every time a classmate didn't do what I asked, I would punch or slap her. I always laughed and thought I was acting playfully, but for some reason, the other girls didn't think it was very funny. Then we had a week of prayer at the school. The pastor read from the Bible about how we can draw closer to Jesus. He spoke about how Jesus will return soon and take us to live with him forever. I wanted to live with Jesus and I decided to be baptized. When I told the pastor, he was so happy and said I needed to ask my parents for permission. Then I became scared because nobody in my family belonged to the Adventist church. I was so scared that my parents would be angry that I didn't ask them and I didn't get baptized. A year passed. I kept jokingly hitting the girls in my class and they became very unhappy. My teacher also wasn't pleased and told me to stop. Then we had another week of prayer. The more I learned about Jesus, the happier I became. I wanted to be closer to Jesus and happy all the time. I realized that my love for Jesus was bigger than the fear of my parents' reaction to baptism. When I told my parents, they didn't say anything negative at all. They said I was old enough to make my own decision. A few days after my baptism, I was lying on my bed, thinking about my life. I remembered all the times that I had hit other girls, and I felt horrible. I decided to change my attitude and be nicer. If the other girls asked me to buy something at the store, I would try my hardest to help them. With Jesus' help, I have not punched or slapped anyone again. When I just think about hitting someone, I feel awful. Jesus has changed my heart, and I am grateful to him. Flora is now 17 and studying in the 12th grade at Ebi Seventh-day Adventist School. Students at this mission-focused school grow close to each other and to God. Teachers help the children develop personal relationships with Jesus. Please pray for the students and staff at the Ebi Seventh-day Adventist School.
I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we just pause in your presence right now. You said in times like these that we should just be still and know that you are God. You are a great and mighty God. You are loving. You are a God who cares for us so much. In fact, when the burden of sin weighs heavily upon us and when the cares of this world lays heavily upon us, when uncertainty has become a reality for so many people, you invite us by saying, come now, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We thank you for this wonderful assurance that we can tru truly find rest in your presence. And that rest goes far beyond the physical and mental rest, but the wonderful spiritual rest with the assurance that's, that comes to us when you also say, um, come now, let us reason together. And though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. We thank you for this wonderful invitation to know that you have said, let us reason together, that you are not so high and lofty that you cannot draw near to your people. And so, Father, we open our hearts to you today. We ask that you will come in and live your life within us. We pray that you will cleanse us and clear our minds, Lord, that we may empty it of anything which is unlike you. And Lord, we replace it with all that which is gracious, that which is pure, that which is holy, that which is righteous. Lord, we just thank you for being a patient God and, and a God that still endures when we, when we fail and when we uh, fall and when we mess up in our lives, you are still there for us. And uh, you've said, Lord, in those wonderful words that we, he that confesses his sin shall have mercy. And so we thank you for being the kind of God that you are. We thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. We know the situations in which we live in. We know the uncertainties in which we live. We know, Lord, that there are uh, many questions about how things will pan out in the future. But Lord, we know that you are in control and we put our absolute trust in you. So bless us through this service. May you speak to our hearts and may we be truly encouraged and challenged to have a closer walk with you today. May you be with the speaker and the message that has been prepared. And may we truly respond in a positive way to the voice of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, BUC family, friends, loved ones, and all of those of you who will be viewing this broadcast today. You know, in the arena of sports, the question is always asked, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest boxer? Is it Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali? Who's the greatest basketball player, even as the Los Angeles Lakers and the Miami Heats are on the NBA Finals? Uh, right now? Is it Kobe Bryant? Is it uh, uh, James? Is it uh, Magic Johnson? Who, who is the greatest basketball player? Who's the greatest football player? Is it Pele? Is it Messi? Is it Ronaldo? Who is the greatest cricketer? Is it Sir Garfield Sobers? Sachin Tendulkar? Who? Who is the greatest? Brian Lara? Well, today, our sermon is actually entitled, Who is the Greatest? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercies, and we thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to share in your word. We pray that you will touch your people once again and bring clarity to our lives so that our service can be pure and undefiled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text for meditation and where the parochopy uh, comes from 
is Mark 9, 33 to 37. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not, uh, whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Who is the greatest is one of the questions in Christendom that echoes and re-echoes throughout the annals of time. If this question is answered correctly, one's life and service can take on new meaning. You see, the majority of Palestinian Jews in the time of Jesus lived in small towns and villages. Further, the majority of the people lived in abject poverty. Most lived on subsidized food rations, as we will say today in the United Kingdom, they lived on benefits. Even Jesus' family was born, even Jesus was born to a poor family. This we know because Mary made use of the concession offered to poor people and brought two doves as an offering for her purification. Jerusalem in the time of Jesus was a center for mendicancy or begging, giving of arms. It was encouraged because it was regarded as particularly meritorious when done in the holy city. These were all, there were many famines and most had only one meal per day. The time of Jesus was full of the devastating effects of poverty, political strife, religious extremism, cultural barriers, and hopelessness. These were the times in which the disciples lived, and Jesus was saddled with the responsibility to teach them about true greatness. You see, in Mark 9, 33 to 37, we have an expose of how we should learn and understand greatness. Verse 33 gives us the impression that Capernaum was some kind of home for Jesus. He asked the question to the disciples as he sat in that home. What were you discussing? See, Jesus did not always walk besides his disciples. He often went before them thinking his deep thoughts while they followed thinking their vain thoughts. Uh, the master had noticed that something unusual was going on, and now he divined what it was, and now he asks the question, what were you disputing? What were you discussing? The disciples were ashamed. They bowed their heads because they knew that they were arguing among themselves about primacy. When we look at verse 4, you see they had been disputing, not about the coming death of the master, for he had made it clear that he will go to Calvary and die for the sins of mankind. And so they were not disputing, they were not talking about his death, they were not discussing how they would live after he was gone, but instead they were disputing and discussing the relative rank of each of them in the kingdom. Uh, they were ex ex still expecting him to establish a earthly kingdom in spite of the fact that he had said to them that his kingdom was not of this world. It was uh, a heavenly kingdom. There was jealousy among them. There was rivalry among them. It was not a mere abstract query, as they put it to Jesus, 
but it was a canker in their hearts. They kept silent. They were ashamed to tell the master. So the master took his seat and called his disciples with a magisterial tone. For you see, back in those days when the teacher wanted to teach, he would sit with his students. He would sit with his disciples so that they can understand. He did not stand over them. He wanted them to understand, so he sat with them. This 12 were called to an important vocation and they needed through discipline to be of service in it. The direct answer to the question, who is the greatest? Greatness comes by humility and service. And therefore Jesus produced a child, a child. This must have been the most important child in the world at that point. Jesus called this child. He produced this child not as a model, but as an object of kind treatment. Jesus took him into his arms and cradled him to symbolize how all that a child represents should be treated. It was an object lesson to the arrogant conceit of the 12 disciples who were contending for primacy. The child was used as a rebuke to the apostles. Uh, the biblical commentator Lane posits that in the time of Jesus, at all points in society, in worship, in the administration of justice, at meals, in all dealings, there constantly arose the question of who was the greatest. And estimating the honor due to each was a task which had to be fulfilled constantly and was felt very important. Therefore, the discussion the disciples had were something very prevalent in that time. Since they were part of the societal culture, this issue occupied their minds and blinded their eyes to the true meaning of God's kingdom. Both Jew and Gentile had an attitude to children that differed from the one prevalent today. Now, there's a tendency to idealize childhood as the happy days of innocence, insouciance, a, a carefree time, a, a simple faith. However, a different attitude prevailed among the Jews and Gentiles during the time of Jesus. The child was considered a person of no importance, meriting of no attention or favors. Children were the most vulnerable members of society. Childhood in antiquity was a time of terror. Infant mortality rates sometimes reached 30%. Another 30% of live births were dead by age 6, and 60% were gone by age 16. Children always suffered first from famine, war, disease, and dislocation. In many cases, few would live to adulthood with both parents alive. The orphan was a stereotype of the weakest and most vulnerable member of society. Children had little status within the family or community. A minor child was on par with a slave. As a matter of fact, Jeffers in his book wrote uh, that a Roman soldier writing home to his wife said, if it is a boy uh, leaving his wife pregnant and writing to her during his time away on duty, he said, if it is a boy, keep him. If it is a girl, expose her. What did he mean? Well, obviously, if it was a boy, keep him. If it was a girl, expose her, meaning throw her away, throw her to the roadside, leave her there for some wild animal to eat or for someone to take as a slave. Uh, so girls were not valid. Boys were more valid. But even in that state of being a child, it was a very vulnerable, very vulnerable time. You know, just like the plight of the child in antiquity. Uh, sometimes the church could be a place of hurt and pain for those 
who are uh, considered to be less by leaders. The lesson of the child had to be learned by the disciples to correct their perspective of greatness and must be learned by us also. They had greatness all wrong. Their silence when Jesus questioned them was an admission that their thinking was wrong. Jesus tried to teach them what real greatness in the kingdom was about, serving even the least. Sometimes we are told that we have to love people for Jesus' sake, or we are to, told to love Jesus in them. I submit to you today that that is a condescension rather than love. Any kind of love that says you are really not lovable, but for Jesus' sake, I will love you, is a caricature uh, or, or making a mockery of love. What are some of the important lessons that we can learn from Jesus today and this story? Who is the greatest, number one, should be a question that should never be asked among the followers of Christ. The suggested primacy of Peter and the request made by the mother of James and John were circumstances that soon attracted the attention of the others and gave rise to the discussion as to relative superiority. Number two, learn this lesson. A vast percentage of the failures and scandals in Christi Christianity has arisen from this contention, whether carried on in silence or expressed publicly. You see, beloved, one of my favorite authors wrote this statement years ago, found in the book, The Acts of the Apostles, page 549. I quote, it is not the opposition of the world that most endangers the church of Christ. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of believers that works their most grievous disaster and most surely retards the progress of God's cause. There is no super sure way to weaken the spirituality of God's people than by cherishing envy suspicion, fault-finding, and evil surmising. On the other hand, the strongest witness that God has sent His Son into the world is the existence of harmony and union among men of varied dispositions who form His church. This witness, it is the privilege of the followers of Christ to bear. But in order to do this, they must place themselves under Christ's will, under His guidance. Their character must be confirmed to His character and their wills to His will. Number three, we can understand today and learn that the highest achievement in the kingdom of God can only be gotten by the one who abases and forgets himself altogether in the benefit and advancement of others. The sitting down of Christ and his summons to his disciples prove the all-important lesson. So he took a child to teach us the lesson of humility. The fourth lesson I want you to learn here today is this. Like the plight of the child, in antiquity. Uh, there are those who, in our church, in our society, who are hurt by the actions of those who think that they are superior. Here is what one of my favorite authors said again. I quote, I am sorry that there are those in positions of trust who very sparingly cultivate sympathy and tenderness of Christ. They do not even cultivate and manifest love towards their brethren and sisters who are in the faith. They do not exercise the precious tact that should bind and heal those who go astray, but instead they exhibit cruelty of spirit that drives the wanderer still farther into the dark and makes angels weep. 
Some seem to find a sort of pleasure in bruising and wounding souls who are ready to die. As I look upon men who handle sacred truth, who bear sacred responsibilities, and who are failing to cultivate a spirit of love and tenderness, I feel like crying out, turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? The fifth point I would like to make here is that the lowest in the kingdom of God should be shown the purest sympathy. The most disinterested and unselfish service should be given to them. The noblest deeds in God's world are of this kind. James echoes the sentiment of Mark when he wrote, Pure religion is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, James 1.27. It is not about how rich or educated you are. It is about loving and giving yourself unconditionally for the service of others and in the service of others. This is what makes the lowliest service and the highest service equal. The service we render must be a natural outgrowth of our sense of humility and gratitude for all that God has done for us. The honor is not to him who sits at the table, for anyone can do that. But the honor is to him who takes a towel and serves everyone. True greatness, my friends, is to see the kingdom and discern its lofty spiritual and heavenly character and learn our littleness in the presence of it. The true greats are those who are willing to step aside that others may pass. Those who are willing to love the unlovable. Those who are willing to make that visit in an age where visitation is a lost art. Those who are willing to go down into the slums and ghettos of this world and let poor, disen inherited, disoriented, disenfranchised people know that God's kingdom has not forgotten them. The truly great are the laborers, the men and women who always see the kingdom to be greater than themselves. Our aim must not be for medals, decorations, plaudits, and rewards, but in the deep hidden fact that the kingdom's welfare has been mostly advanced by those who have remained humble in spite of position, pay, or pain. Mark in this text shows us that the greatest thing we can do is to serve those who are forgotten and regarded as insignificant, those who have no influence, no title, no priority, and no importance except to God. Through the eyes of Mark, I picture a community where no one is to be treated as a kingpin or as a no entity. Ah, oh, Mother Teresa, that great laborer for the poor in India, uh, she wrote this. She says, I quote, I am a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. I say today, friends, what's your perspective on greatness? Who is the greatest? What's your perspective on life? What's your perspective on how we treat people and what we ought to do and how we approach the issues of life? You see, because we have taller buildings, but shorter tempers. We have wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less common sense, more knowledge, but less judgment more experts, but more problems, more medicine, but less wellness, 
We spend too recklessly, laugh too little, drive too fast, get too angry too quickly, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too seldom, watch TV too much, and we pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and lie too often. We have learned how to make a living, but not a life. We have added years to life, not life to years. We have been all the way to the moon and back, but have trouble crossing the street to meet the new neighbor. We have conquered outer space, but not inner space. We have done larger things, but not better things. We have cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. We have split the autumn, but not our prejudice. We write more, but hear less. Plan more, but accomplish less. We have learned to rush, but not to wait. We have higher incomes, but lower morals. More food, but less appeasement. More acquaintances, but fewer friends. More effort, but less success. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but have less communication. We have become long on quantity, but short on quality. These are the times of fast food and slow digestion. Tall men and short characters. Steep prophets and shallow relationships. These are the times of world peace, but domestic warfare. More leisure and less fun. More kinds of food, but less nutrition. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce. Fancier homes, but broken homes. These are the days of throw away morality and quick trips. One night stands. These are the days when there is Time. This is a time when there is much in the showroom, the show window, and there is nothing in the stock room. What's your perspective on greatness today, my friends? Are you one of those who perpetuate this Lord it over all attitude? Are you one of those who have not surrendered? your will, your ego, and everything you are to God? Are you one of those who pick on the weak and the vulnerable? Are you one of those who take advantage of people because of your position, your pay? Are you one of those Christians who think that you have everything, you have all the truth, you have all the knowledge, and therefore no one could teach you anything, you can't learn anything, or you have arrived, you are there in heaven already? Or are you one of those who look to Jesus and recognize that even though you may have achieved your degrees and your pedigree, you are still nothing. You humble yourself before God so that he can teach you. Are you one of those who say, Lord Jesus, I come before you like David. I go into my little closet and I ask you the question in the silence of my day. Lord, who am I that you should die for me? Lord, who am I that you should be preparing a mansion for me above? Lord, who am I? that every day you should give me food and give me blessings and, and be there for me, for my family and for those that I love. Who am I, Lord? And when you come out of that closet, you will understand, you will get the answer. I do this for you because you are my child. I want you to remain humble. I want you to be kind. I want you to love people. I want you to help people, not take bread out of people's mouth and out of their children's mouth. I want you to be there for people, to help people. I will give you strength. I will direct you. I will make your leadership exemplary. I will make your Christian life a blessing. I will give you strength to go down into the ghettos and 
the byways and the highways and the estates and, and I will help you to help people so that they can be all that I want them to be. I will use you as an instrument. This is God's message to us today. God wants to use us wherever we are, whatever status we, we, we find ourselves inheriting or have. Wh wh whoever we are, come to God just as you are without one plea, recognizing that his blood was shed for you and that he died for you. He is giving you life live for him and he's coming back for you. So the next time that you think about being great, that you are great and you're lording it over somebody or some situation, remember Jesus took a child. God, we thank you for your word to us today. Please God, instill that spirit of humility within us. Because God, if we don't have it, your work will be hindered. Your kingdom will be held back. The people that you have there that need saving will struggle, God. So let your Holy Spirit engulf us and take us to a different level of operating in your kingdom, a, a humble level, a level that you can work with us and through us. Bless everyone, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank Pastor Kirk Thomas for that powerful message and for the way in which um, he has allowed us, um, the Holy Spirit has allowed us to really take root of what has been said today. And I pray that something that has been said will resonate with you and allow you and challenge you to have a closer walk with God. We wanna thank you for joining us this morning. We thank you for your presence here. We'll be here next week again. And now may God bless you for the rest of the Sabbath day and join with us as we close with our final hymn.